So if you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn with me to 1 John chapter 4? 1 John chapter 4, as we continue uh, in our journey, in our series of 1 John this morning. 1 John chapter 4, so grab your Bibles, uh, your devices, whatever you can get in your hands, because you're going to want to see this as we journey through uh, 1 John this morning, 1 John chapter 4. Four. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever taken a personality test, uh, it can be pretty interesting. Uh, if you've ever, uh, in, in business, interviewing for a job, a uh, company, organization, you probably, this day and time, have taken a personality test. Uh, the only problem with personality tests is there's all kinds of them. And, and sometimes they're pretty humorous. I mean, you have some personality tests that uh, you take, and you, if you're honest, you ask questions, then, then you get the answer of who you are, and you you're, you're end up being an animal. Okay? So congratulations, you're a, a Labrador retriever uh, or, you know, or, or something like that. So you know, you're a real, real, real sweetheart. Everyone loves you, but a toy poodle can basically run you over. Or maybe you're a bulldog or you're an otter or you're a shark or, or something like that. You're basically an animal and that sums up uh, your personality. Some other personality uh, tests are your, your letter. So the DIS test, you're a D or you're an I or an S. You have maybe a mix of them. Uh, but different personality tests, what they're really trying to do is to get down to who you really are, the focus of what really drives you. I remember taking a personality test uh, a few years ago and I was doing it on the laptop uh, for an organization. I was sitting there and I was taking it at the very end I was astonished by the results, and my wife, Devin, was sitting in the living room, and I said, sweetheart, can you believe that this test told me that this is who I was? And she was kind of, you know, snickering in the other room, like, yeah, I'm, I'm real shocked, sweetheart. Yeah, I, I can't believe that. But that's what these tests really do. They get to the core of who you really are, not who you want to be, right? Not who you want other people to think you are, but really who you truly are. When it's all said and done, this is who you are. This is what drives you. This is just your default mode. On your best day, on your worst day, this is who you are. Here's a question we need to think about. What if we gave a personality test to God? What do you think that would look like? I mean, we have the basic structure uh, in, the, in the text. We have the basic understanding of, of who he is, kind of the skeleton uh, we have the doctrine, we have the theology, but what if we got through all of that and got to the real heart of God? What would we find there? And in First uh, First John chapter four, uh, we're going to see that that we're, what we're going to see is at the heart of God is His love, His love for Himself and His own glory. You read through all out the scriptures, you're going to see that that God does for his own namesake and his own glory, and he loves us. And this is the heart of this chapter and this text. What John is really pushing forward is God's love for us. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God has made manifest among us that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10, don't miss this. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, not just loved us, but so loved us. Think John 3, 16. God so loved the world. If God so loved us, beloved, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Now at first glance, this sounds like a text about how we should love other people. And if you pay attention, we've actually skipped a little bit because we were in 1 John 
uh, chapter 2 and, and chapter 3 last week, and we talked about what it means to live a holy life. And really there's two things that John is trying to push forward in this journey of this epistle. One is, is that for the Christian, John wants us to know, like little children, and he's kind of like our spiritual father, that we need to have clarity and confidence. If we truly know God and we truly know his word, no matter what is happening around us, no, no matter what pandemic is happening around us, no matter what's happening in our bank account, no matter what's happening in our marriages and our family, we can have clarity and confidence in Christ. Christians aren't people that just kind of wonder, uh, that are unsteady. We are firm in who Christ is. All of 100% of our faith and 100% of our leaning in life is upon him, not on ourselves and not the world. So that's the first thing John wants us to know. The second thing that John wants us to know is that as Christians, there is obvious and easy to see fruit of our faith. That we can see that we are Christians because one, he says, uh, that we love the Lord. Uh, two, that we love other people. Three, uh, that we live lives of holiness. And four, we don't like the world, the darkness of the world. And then he also talks about being on guard against false teaching. So we've talked about those things, but John emphasizes this so much that he actually repeats this. And getting into, uh, back into chapter 3, he talks again about how we should love one another. So if you want to get to love, John's going to hit on this a lot. So he gets into uh, chapter 3, love one another. And then at the start of chapter 4, he goes back to test the spirits. You need to test what you hear. Just because somebody gets up on a stage like me and has a mic and has the scriptures, that doesn't mean that you just need to take everything I say at face value. You need to test it by the Word of God. I mean, you can drive by, uh, you know, out of town for 20 minutes and probably see a house with a sign in the yard that says, hey, come in and I will read your hand and tell you what your future is. There's all kinds of people uh, in the world today saying that this is truth. You need to listen to me. And as Christians, we need to be the group of people, probably the most, uh, that test what truth really is, and it's according to God's Word. But this passage, John's hitting on God's love. So if we, if we get past, if we gave God a personality test, and our personality, uh, even a psychologist would say, even over time, it's possible for personalities to even change. Uh, you bring in trauma, uh, you bring in uh, financial success, you, you, people can uh, change and personalities can even change. If you've ever done the love language test, right? Uh, sometimes your love language may look one way when you get married, but 20, 30 years down the road, those may change. The great thing about God is he does not change. His love and his character is stable. So if you have the basic structure, the basic skeleton of who God is, and you get past all of that, and you get to the heart of God, you're going to get, and you're going to see that God loves us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I talk or think or sing about God's love for me, I get extremely uncomfortable. And one of the reasons why is just because I don't understand it. I, I love, and maybe it's just because I'm a pastor, I, but I don't, it's not just because I'm a pastor. I love theology. I love to read systematic theology. I love to study doctrine. But one of the things I still can't wrap my mind around, the most difficult doctrine there is, is God's love for us. Why is it so hard, Christian, to understand and to be able to wrap our minds around God's love for us? Well, that's actually an easy question to answer because we have it. If you look back at chapter 3, look at chapter 3 with me, starting in verse 19. John says this, By this we shall know. There's, there's that clarity, that confidence. We shall know. We're not wondering. We're not guessing. We're not kind of, yeah, maybe we're hoping this works out. No. We know, by this we shall know, that we are of the truth. Now listen to this. This is really interesting. So we know the truth. We're solid in our faith. And reassure our hearts before him. 
why would I need reassurance if I already know the truth? If John is professing through this whole epistle, Christians are firm, Christians are confident, uh, confident. Christians are, have clarity. We're not wondering, we're stable, we're secure in our understanding of who God is, not just in our heart, but also in our minds. Why would we need to reassure ourselves? By this we shall know, chapter 3, verse 19, that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he, this is so crucial, he knows everything. Why, John, why in the world would I need to reassure my heart if I am confident in God's love for me? He just answers it. Because our heart condemns us at some times. Why? Because he knows everything. We, and in our human hearts, are constantly aware that God just doesn't know some things about us. He knows everything about us. Uh, Christian, you uh, need to be aware, if, you don't, if you're not aware already, that God just doesn't kind of know a little bit about you. He knows everything about you. If you study the Gospels, what you'll see is that Jesus shows up in a crowd and how does he, uh, ba you know, what is, how does Jesus know what he's going to talk about? It's not based on what people are saying. It's based on what people are thinking. So as, as Jesus shows up, you'll study in the scriptures, especially parables uh, in the Gospel of Luke, for example. Uh, you'll, you'll see that the text says, as Jesus knows what they were thinking. Not just what they were saying, but Jesus knowing their thoughts, Jesus talked about this, or Jesus told a parable of this based on their thinking. So it's not that just Jesus knows your, uh, what you say or what your actions are. He knows your thoughts. I mean, talk about an in invasion of privacy. <laughs> there is no privacy laws when it comes to God. He knows everything. You might be around somebody and, and, and you would, and maybe it's in your family or maybe a friend and you would go, why, why, why would you, why would you say that? Why would you, that's, that's so hurtful. Or why would you, why would you say that? That's so, that's so wrong. When it comes to Jesus, uh, can you imagine being around him in, in the New Testament or even now, if you could actually be around the physical, literal Jesus, if you walked in your house and had dinner with you, uh, he would, he would know your thoughts. There's no privacy laws with, with God. He knows our thoughts. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you thought in the past. Hey, we, we talk all the time that God knows what I'm going to do. In the, uh, he, he knows what I did in the past. He knows what I'm doing in the present. But God also knows what I'm going to do in the future. A friend, it, it, it gets worse than that. He also knows what you're going to think in the future. God knows everything about us. And so when we are under that reality that God knows everything we're going to do, past, present, and in the future, and God is aware of what we're going to think, past, present, and in the future, our hearts do what? Our human hearts condemn us. They, they, they cringe. I don't know if you've ever maybe even said this uh, during our, uh, the, this virus pandemic, but you know, if you've ever said to someone or had the thought about someone, I really love you. I, I, I promise you, I really do love you. But I, I just can't stand you right now, okay? <laughs> I, I promise you, I love you. I, I do. I, that, and that will never change. I will always love you. But I just can't be around you right now. I, I can't even talk to you right now. I, I, I just need some space. I think sometimes in our human heart, that's what we think that God thinks about us. I, I, I know that God loves me. And I, I, I even believe God will always love me. But I just think, because God knows everything about me. God knows my thoughts. God knows my actions. He knows my heart. Everything that's going on inside of me. I know that he loves me. I'm just convinced that God probably doesn't want to be near me. Probably doesn't want to be around me. So why in the world 
does John hit on? That we should love God, that we should love people, that we should pay attention and not love the things of the world, the darkness, the evil of the world, and be on guard against false teaching. What's the main motivation behind all that? Because God first loved us, does love us. Even when our hearts condemn us, even when we walk around with the awareness that he knows everything. That I, I can't clothe myself enough. I, I can't arm myself enough. I am c- totally naked in the presence of God. He knows everything. All of my sins, all of my thoughts, everything that I don't even know about myself. My heart condemns me, but God, I know loves me. The Bible, thankfully, knows the objections we have when we think about God's love or hear that God loves us. We, we, our heart cringes and condemns us, but we know God loves us. I love, there's a new book out right now by um, Dane Ortland called The Gentle and Lowly, and he says this, as long as you fix your attention on your sin, you will fail to see how you can be safe. But as long as you look to the high priest, Christ, you will fail to see how you can be in danger. Looking inside of ourselves, our own heart, we can anticipate only harshness from heaven. But looking out to Christ, we can anticipate only gentleness. So so there it is. When we look at the heart of ourselves, at the heart of our sin, we constantly think, yeah, probably God loves us, but from the throne room of heaven, I am sure that I am under a harshness and bitterness, that God only loves me because he has to. He's kind of being held hostage by his own holiness. But really, his everyday attitude towards me is probably, I'm almost convinced of it, is what? Harshness and bitterness towards me. That's not the gospel and that's not the Bible. That God just doesn't love us on the day of salvation. But he adores us today. Our hearts condemn us. But God's heart is for us. God's heart is for us. This is why the gospel isn't just something we need to recite every day, but something we need to remember and celebrate every day. That's why uh, John brings up in in chapter 4, verse 10, in that this is love, not that we we have loved God, but that he he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What does that word mean? That just means that Jesus Christ on the cross satisfied once and for all, drank the full cup of God's wrath towards our sin. Yes, God has uh, wrath on sin, but Jesus bore that full weight. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see wrath anymore. He sees love and favor only reserved for the Christian. It's a kingdom reality. This is so why we just can't recite the gospel every day. We need to celebrate and walk in the freedom of the gospel every day. I mean, listen, if anybody knew, if anybody knew the love of God, it was John. John knew for sure the love of God because he saw him on the cross. Now John's not perfect, but all the other disciples are what? All the other disciples are in hiding when Jesus is dying on the cross. But John is standing before the cross. Why does John speak about God's love so much? Why does John talk about love so much? Because he was there at the foot of the cross, at the gospel. He saw the gospel being displayed on the cross. The love of God perfectly portrayed through the death of Jesus Christ. John is standing there at his feet and he knows. He just doesn't uh, believe by someone telling him. He saw and witnessed the love of God. I love how A.W. Tozer says this. Audacious faith 
dares to believe the word of God and claim friendship with God. We do God more honor by believing what he said about himself and having courage to come boldly to the throne of grace than by hiding in self-conscious humility among the trees of the garden. Our feelings about our own sin and our heart about our own iniquity are just feelings. Now there, there's some truth in it, but God's heart is different than our heart. Chapter 3, thankfully, 1 John, is different than chapter 4 where our hearts condemn us. God's heart is for us. God's heart loves us. And as hard as it is to wrap our minds around that, the Bible rises above our feelings. You know, we can't depend on our heart and we can't depend on our feelings. They're, uh, they just, they're up and down day to day. They're depending on, on how much coffee we had this morning. Our feelings are not stable. Our personality is not stable. Our affections and our love is not stable. But God's love is stable. It is secure. It's locked in through the cross of Christ. It does not change. I remember a family hearing this story a family in Birmingham about six, seven years ago. And they adopted a, a son. They adopted a, a boy. And the first few nights, they were sitting around the table. And this, and this boy that they just adopted, at the end of the dinner, they had a, a good time and, and laughing and, and sharing stories. And, and he was like six, seven years old. But right after the dinner, he just slaved away and started cleaning up everyone's dishes. And it was really, it was awkward because uh, they were like, you know, dinner's not over and we're still talking, we're still, but he just took it upon himself to clean up everyone's dishes and everyone's mess. And finally the father came to, the, came to his new son, his ad adopted son, and said, well, uh, can I ask you a question? Why, why are you doing this? You don't have to do this. And the, and the child said, in the home that I just came from, I only knew that I was loved by what I did. And if I didn't do things like this, I was not loved. And the father, true story, sat down with him, looked him right in the face and said, you are not in that home anymore. You're in a new home. And in this home, your, your love, our love for you is not based on you doing the dishes. You serving us. Our love for you is just automatic because you're in the family now and you're at the table. That's it. Christian, your love, God's love for you is not based on your love for him. You're not in that home anymore. You, you're not in a home where your heart even post-salvation tells you that you better keep it up, that if you slip up one more time, God's not going to love you anymore. You are not in that home anymore. You're in a new home. Uh, the picture of baptism should show you that, that you're raised to walk in a new way of living. The new home that you're in does not condemn you, even though your heart sometimes tells you that. The new home that you and I are in is a love of God that surpasses all those things, that loves us no matter what. What John was dealing with in 1 John was this false teaching of these Gnostics that were coming in and saying, God is not a real physical person uh, who loves like this. He's more of a removed kind of spiritual person uh, that is detached. It's kind of a, a deistic kind of understanding of God. Uh, that he's creator and he, he, he does these things, but really he's totally attached and not involved relationally with his children. And John is just completely smashing this to pieces. That God is love. God does love you and that love is secure. 
When we avoid or push back, as I do all the time, God's love, anytime I hear a sermon about God's love or hear a song on the radio about God's love or start reading about God's love in the scriptures or even a book outside the Bible, I kind of cringe and I want to talk about my love for God. But when we push back and avoid God's love for us, we do two things, Christian. Two things we do when we avoid God's love. Number one, we rob God of his glory. Or at least we try to. We can't completely rob God of his glory. God's going to get his glory no matter what. But we attempt, we try to rob God of his glory because part of his glory is how much he loves us. So, so think about uh, your child's uh, Christmas uh, coming up this year or, or birthday or something where you went out and maybe you got a second job or, or you like, you know, you, you took out a loan, but you, you went all in to get the gift that was the best gift you can imagine. It's going to be the greatest gift this, this child will ever receive in their whole life outside of salvation. You went all in and you got the greatest gift. And it's sitting outside in the parking lot or in the garage. And you go to your child and say, I, I bought you a, a gift and I, I want to show it to you. I, I want to give it to you. And that child goes, well, that's great, but I just don't deserve it. And, and they're real humble about it, and they're real cute about it, and they go out and see the gift, and, and they're, but, you know, they don't want to unwrap it yet, and they don't want to receive it yet because uh, they're trying to be humble. Well, that's cute and adorable for like five minutes. But if you went all in, and, you, you know, you took out a second mortgage, and you took out a loan, and you, and you did, you got a second job, you did everything you can to attain and buy this gift, after a while, humility needs to go away. It, you, you tell the child, I, I, it, cost me, it cost you nothing. It cost me everything. You're, you're going to receive this gift. That's what the gospel is like. That our humility, it's good up to a certain point. God has bought us adopted us and brought us in. We are expected to sit at the table. We're expected to receive God's love. And to avoid that and to push that back is not humility. It's a form of pride. God loves us. And as hard as it is to wrap our minds around that, God is not expecting us to have some uh, un uh, mental understanding 100% of God's love. But he is asking us not to push back on it. When we try to avoid God's love for us, we're trying to rob him of the glory and beauty of the cross that cost his son his life. Number two, when we avoid and push back God's love for us, even though it's difficult, we rob ourselves of the greatest blessing. What greater blessing, Christian, do you have than God's love for you? I mean to step on your toes to say that your, your degree, that your success in your career, uh, the, the cars or boats uh, that you have in your, in your house, uh, in your parking lot, uh, in, in your garage, the, the, you know, your, your golf score, you know, whatever it is, does not attain and does not rise above the love of God. Dear Christian, you do not have anything above God's love for you. It's the greatest possession that you have. No matter what you attain, no matter what you succeed, no matter what your children succeed, all good things, the greatest treasure you have is God's love for you. My son and I always have this conversation all the time. When he does something wrong, and he does something wrong, as a normal six-year-old does all the time. The question always comes back, God, Dad, do you still love me? And as, as a parent, you're almost offended by it. And you, Child, of course I love you. Of course there's consequences. But my love for you doesn't change. What's the application to 1 John chapter 4? What do I want you to pray through and apply to your life this week? Simply one thing. 
Not two things, not three things, just one thing. I want you, dear Christian, to think, meditate, sing, allow yourself this week to be reminded about how much God loves you. There is no ceiling, there's no height, there's no depth. The love of God is not a kiddie pool of doctrine. It's an ocean. And it's an ocean that you're expected to swim in. It's, it's, it's an understanding that you're expected to, to, to worship God and enjoy. It was bought for you to walk around in freedom that God is not some, God's love for you is not some ticking time bomb. It, it's a green pasture to enjoy and to walk in. There's nothing you can do to ever hurt or damage God's love for you. It's something for you to walk in. That's why all the time you read the epistles in the New Testament, it begins and ends with the gospel. Let the peace of Christ be with you. Let the grace of Christ be with you. As Christians, we are supposed to walk in the grace and peace of God no matter what's happening. John 3.16 is not the kiddie pool verse of the scriptures. It is the deepest ocean of the knowledge of God. It is the heart of God. His great love for us. Would you pray with me? Father God, we pray.